This is part 3 of a commentary I'm doing with 8363MTR on Mr. Enter. Links to part 1 and 2 are below. What's next, Arthur? How bad could it be? So, what have you been up to lately? Good fucking lord. What the hell happens to the animation? This looks like a 90s entertainment game. No, wait. The Arthur games from the 90s look better than this. Oh yeah, Arthur went to Flash animation for for some reason I can't understand. I don't know. Maybe they like money or something? Um, let me rephrase that. Essentially, this is because they're trying to save up some money. An average cost of each Evader Sim episode was a million and a half, and that's roughly about the same figure for Avatar The Last Airbender. Really low budget stuff can be as low as $350,000, and that's not counting anime with the typical episode costing about $125,000. Well, although that I can't find the exact number for flashy animation and its cost, because the answers that I'm getting are very depending on the different studios, it's actually considered to be cheaper, because instead of spending hours of drawing and redrawing scenes, and having to purchase cells, paint, and drawing tools, you have rigs in which you can change the position of your character, which makes it quicker and cheaper that way. It used to be hand-drawn, and it had a lot of personality that was reminiscent in the original Arthur books. Look, I know the PBS is publicly funded, but this kind of animation quality is not acceptable. Call me crazy, but am I the only one who thinks this explanation of why the animation in the newer episodes of Arthur is... lackluster? Like, sure, he talks about the original animation before the change, but he hasn't talked about exactly why the animation is bad specifically after the change. Is the movement considered to be bad? Are the designs of the characters in the background are bad? Is there... Anything else I'm actually missing about it? You don't really elaborate your explanation except for the fact that we just... kinda have to guess what you meant with the clips that you've just shown us. Hell, I'll go one step farther than my co-op partner. Don't even give me away it's bad, just give me away it's different. Maybe it's because I didn't watch Arthur as a kid? But best as I can tell, the animation looks basically the same before and after the jump to Flash. The characters look the same, they move the same way, and it's in the same art style. Compare this to, say, the last season of The Fairly Odd Parents, which also had a sudden jump to Flash, where the art style was completely changed, as was the way the characters moved. The only the only difference that John cites is that the hand-drawn animation looks close to the original book, which, yeah, obviously it would, because the books were hand-drawn because the first book was published in 1976. Also, what do you mean by reminiscent of the books? Because the designs in the books were far from homogenous. This, for example, is how Arthur looked in the first book, Arthur's Nose. Notice how it is completely different from how Arthur looks in the TV show. This is how Arthur looked on the original cover of his second book, Arthur's Eyes. Notice how not only is it very different from the TV show, it's also very different from the cover of the first book. Here is Arthur in his sixth book, Arthur's Halloween, in 1982, where he is this weird potato brown for some reason. Here's Arthur in his seventh book, 1983's Arthur's April Fool. His design is the closest we've seen so far to the design that was used in the TV show, but his face is still too long for it to really be the same design of Arthur. Exactly when Arthur got his modern design is a little bit hard to pinpoint, but it was not until the later part of the 80s. Hence why every single book I've shown you guys so far, except for the first one, had its cover redone at some point specifically to look more like the art of the PBS series, which was first the art of the later books. I should also note that the art in the television show and the art in the books, even the newer ones, do not resemble each other. The art in the books is much more dilapidated, rough, and, well, everything just blends together more than it does on the television show. This isn't abnormal by any means. I remember I had some Curious George books as a kid that also had this same difference from the television show to the book, but it is a difference. While Enter is saying that they look look basically the same when, I'm sorry, they just don't. Anyway, what's Arthur trying to teach people to do today? Is it about how stealing is wrong, or how you should tell the truth, or... Ooh, Trey, shh! 
cheek. Oh, good. It's a pandemic safety PSA. Well, this isn't going to shoot my career in the foot again. We're really doing this again. Do do I have to? Man, I just hate it when I don't know what I'm going to review in the middle of my review on various PSAs about current and controversial topics. Oh uh, yeah, speaking of which, I should probably talk about this PSA. The first Arthur PSA has Muffy and Francine talk about what they've been up to in the video voice chat call, where Muffy's dad shows up and notifies her to get going for a big sales event at Crosswired Motors, and Francine asks her before Muffy leaves if she's going to get a mask. Muffy says no because she believes that only sick people get sick, to which Francine lectures her about why you do need to wear a mask. After much convincing, Muffy Muffy asks her dad to bring a mask over, and she loves the pink one. Which is the part where things go downhill for Enter here. N no I'm generally not joking. You might want to grab a bottle and take a shot or two towards... the start of him making a tangent about mask. Like, people know what I think on this, and, and they don't like what I think about this. If no one ever gave an unpopular opinion, where would your species be as a whole? If you personally suddenly stop talking about this issue, just because you didn't get a response of sunshine and rainbows, what would it say about you and what you truly believe in? If you believe that you are right, it is a duty to continue to speak up, no matter what the consequences are. You must remember that this is who you are. This is a feature, not a bug of who you are. And it is an important feature. The most important feature. Okay, so John spends the next couple of minutes having a back and forth with this robot over if he should do this. It's not even meaningful like it was when he did this in his reviews of things like Mega Babies or The Problem Solvers in large part because it doesn't really build to anything. In Mega Babies, it was about keeping John going when he thought the episode was too much to handle. I... I, I can't do it. I, I can't continue. Oh, this, this... this... is just too awful. Oh, it, it's you. If you cannot do it, then who can? Why, why don't you? You've seen the puke, the drool, not even the splinter fresh fresh air what was this disgusting this is your fight it must be done i i i can't fight it i, I can't not not alone can't, can't do it like this can't do it alone you are not alone there are many who are with you who believe in you you must make your stand here against this abomination I, I, I'm not. I, I am not strong enough. It, it has bested each and every one of my defenses. Nonsense. You are stronger than you think you are. The struggle against the worst that animation has to offer is arduous, and few have fought as bravely as you have. You have fought many battles, won many victories, and have rekindled hope. Uh, hope. You show people that lack of effort can be noticed. An effort can still be praised in this era where creativity is dying. You have the blessing of everyone who knows that their hard work will not go in vain. If not by you, then by someone. Each blessing is a stone to fortify your land. Your castle is strong. Your allies are numerous. Wield what lies within. Wield the sword of hope. And conquer this almighty foe. It, yes. It, it must be done. Let's do this. In The Problem Solvers, it progressed to keeping calm while dealing with something terrible. My eyes! Ow! Oh, okay, you fuckers. That's it. It is so on! I am taking whatever's left of this piece of shit down! Stop. I don't have time for this old man. This show nearly left me blind. I don't want to know what kind of damage this has actually done to me. Sometimes the louder that you shout, the less the people will hear you. What's that supposed to mean? I told you, you weren't ready for Ren Seek's help. It changed you too much. You're becoming angrier, more brutal, and more sporadic. So what? It allowed me to take on some of the worst of the worst, things I can never imagine taking on. Once upon a time, the splinter made me vomit. Now I laugh at the person I once was. I have the power to take on anything now. Power is nothing without grace. You may know how to unleash all this anger, but there's still much you have to learn. There's a where and when, and now is not the time. 
Look, look around you, old guy. This is the worst design show I've ever seen. A show has never given me this much eye strain before. I can barely keep my eyes open. How can this be not the time to release my inner anger? Because this is one of the worst things that you've ever seen. I, I don't get you. Any man can get angry when fighting a foe or a dragon, but the man who can stay calm in the face of even the greatest adversary is the one who most often wins. Sometimes the stronger blow isn't the one that wins, but the one that sees the weak point in the heat of the heaviest, fastest battle. Right. I never used to be able to talk. There was always this inner storm that I could never get out. Now that it is out, I can't seem to contain it. If you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. Finish this review. Alright, I'll, I'll try. I'll try to do it calmly. Here, John is giving himself a pep talk so he can continue giving controversial opinions on current topics. Also known as exactly what he's been doing without trouble for the past half a fucking hour. And that's really the thing that bothers me here. It's not just that this diatribe comes out of nowhere, it's that it's so poorly written, especially compared to Enter's other works. It's basically just him saying, I don't want to do this, and then the robot saying, you have to do this, and then Enter saying, but I don't want to, and the robot saying, but you have to, and then Enter eventually says, oh, okay, I'll do it. Now, tell me, which one sounds more interesting? That, or the two clips I just showed you? Which one has more emotional impact? Which one is actually meaningful? And the worst part about this prep talk it was essentially dragged out. Look, I get it's towards what you're going for, but you can just say, it's okay to have a hot take because it's human nature. I know that. It just seems so futile, so pointless. Like, can I ask a question here? Is literally anything I say going to change anyone's mind? Just, just one person. Because I'm getting tired of speaking into the void. But remember, if you want to change someone's mind, you get the Fucking idea. How far are we into this? We're just about to reach the halfway mark of the video. You mean we're only halfway there, halfway there, halfway there. Seeing people literally comment that they are okay with other people committing suicide if that means that they personally don't have to get sick, even if they are not in an age group where they are at significant risk of any complications. And here we are yet again with Enter making this hypothetical point that no one has actually said whatsoever. Even if for whatever fucked up reason that people have said that, to which I could argue that this is not the majority of people who are in support of lockdowns, but whatever. Then call them out on this! Why are you leaving us in the dark when you may or may not have seen people say that they're okay if someone decides to kill themselves? In fact, if we're going to play your game here, I've been hearing Republicans saying that we should have sacrificed our grandmothers for the economy, or the fact that we should inject everyone with the virus so that our precious little economy wouldn't be hurt by this. And no, I'm not kidding about that last part. The catalyst? Just watch your local news! There's your catalyst! True. Of course! People are getting nervous. And listen, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. All I know is think about how the world would be if you tried to quarantine everybody because of the generic type flu. Now, I'm not saying this is the generic type flu, but maybe we'd be just better off if we gave it to everybody and then in a month it would be over because the mortality rate of this probably isn't going to be any different if we did it that way than the long term picture. But the difference is we're re wreaking havoc on global and domestic economies. Something to know about Rick Santelli if what Wikipedia is telling me is true, he's Republican, even though he's on CNBC. And yeah, sure, he apologizes. But it felt like he was apologizing because he was forced to do it instead of being sincere. And yet, you don't want to pitch in and say something about that? About how they're advocating for more deaths so that they can make the economy have a fiend in D&D? But oh no, mental health is hugely more important. When both physical and mental health should be important, ya doofus. I also want to point out, in Enter's Plague of Moral Convenience video, he specifically says that even if he was going to die of COVID-19, that would not change his opinion on lockdowns or on masks or on 
anything regarding the pandemic that he said. Like, I want to make this clear about my conviction. Even if I were on my deathbed due to the virus, I would still keep my convictions and my belief in the lack of efficacy of lockdowns, and that the negative consequences they cause are too great. That's because it's what a conviction is. It's something you will keep to, no matter what the world around you says, because you truly believe that the consequences are not worth this. Which, side note, I wouldn't call that a conviction so much as I'd call that mindless dogmatism, but okay. But even then, why is it okay for Enter to keep his opinion in extreme circumstances, but not for the people who disagree with him? Oh, speaking of Enter's other videos, if you guys have seen Enter's How the World Ended video, he might make a rebuttal on this point by saying this part here. Because of the media reporting, there's been a stereotype that anti-lockdown people just want haircuts, or they want to sacrifice grandma for the stock market. If you take me seriously as someone who doesn't fall into one of those straw man arguments, I will take you seriously as someone who wants genuine knowledge and information. And to that, I say... At least I have actual evidence about those on the right. Sure, they're anecdotal, but at least I have some that do say that. The closest thing that isn't anecdotal is with the haircut thing, as a Vox article talks about why haircuts became a focus on the anti-lockdown protests, specifically citing that people would literally travel even hundreds of miles to just get a haircut in Yuba and Salter counties in California. Or how about when, during the anti-lockdown protests in Michigan, there was a demonstration demonstration by having people cut someone else's hair. This right here is further proof that some of these anti-lockdown protests do want some of these things to happen. In fact, one of the main reasons why protesters even protest in the first place is so that they can go back to work, which will essentially have them not care about their loved ones or could potentially spread the virus onto other people, specifically to customers just like how Two stylists at a Missouri branch of Great Clips tested positive for the coronavirus and were found to have exposed more than 100 customers to the disease. So in all honesty, I wouldn't really say that this is considered to be a straw man, considering that this is actually happening. You could then say that this is a sweeping generalization, but even if it is, it does paint a very bad picture on the right who only does this for their own selfish desires instead of others. I spent my first years on this platform telling people that going massively into debt for college might be a bad idea. And they just looked at me like I was telling them that magic existed. Now, we have people with like PhDs and master's degrees uh, serving Starbucks, wondering where their life went wrong. But like the possibility that college might not be the right path for them, or that getting a degree in bullshit doesn't automatically guarantee them a good job, was a complete unreality. And a teenager going to college was just as scientifically certain as the sun rising in the morning. And yet, only 42% of Americans go to college after high school. Also, in the beginning of your point, you're exaggerating about student loans and how we're going into massive debt, when that's not the case. Even though one-third of the people leave college with no debt, of those who do have debt, the average is about $27,000. Sure, it's high, but with you saying massively into debt, it begs the question of, what numbers are you talking about? Six digits worth? Because when it comes to debt, it's not $100,000, and it's definitely not $200,000. Oh, and do we need to mention that you've ignored the possibility of having scholarships and grants? Because that's a thing worth mentioning. And then that whole, you end up working at Starbucks anyway bit. Look, you do have to understand that when it comes to the profession that you want to achieve, you do need to have a degree in it. Otherwise, you'll not get the job unless you're lucky. Now, can it be done? Sure, but trying to find a job with only a high school diploma is considered to be worse. As of May the 7th, 2021, even when during that time period we're heading back to normal within the pandemic, those with only a high school diploma had a 6.9 unemployment rate, and those with a bachelor's degree or higher education have a 3.5 unemployment rate. Back in December of 2012, back when the Time Magazine article was made, it was generally the same, with 8.5% unemployment for high school grads, and 38 for college grads with a bachelor's degree or higher education. To quote the article for just a sec, that's partially because the qualities of good students, intelligence, say, or punctuality, are shared by good employees. 
But the fact is that many employees simply wouldn't consider applicants without college degrees, and the worse the job market is, the more employers will be able to demand degrees. Not only that, but only 14.3% with a high school diploma would actually make more than those with a bachelor's degree, which is usually not a lot, so you're more than likely end up earning less. But let's say that you do have the degree, and they reject you. The thing is that no profession is guaranteed to land you a job easily. You have to compete with other people, and sometimes employers just aren't aren't looking for people fresh from school. The student runs into trouble because they are on the hook for a massive loan they have to pay off every month so if they can't land a job they were trained for to help pay that, they are going to struggle and end up doing Starbucks just to get by. And then you'll end up with those kinds of horror stories I guess you're using to make. The thing about it is that it's actually the issue of the cost of education. Think of it like buying a car or a house. Most people can't pay for that stuff out of pocket so that they have to take out a loan to pay for it. When they use the money to get the degree, the person slash bank they took the loan from is going to ask for that money plus interest back on a planned monthly payment. If the student can't pay that, then they start to run into trouble. So if the student can't land a job they were hoping for so that they can pay enough to cover the monthly payment while give them enough money to live comfortably, they're going to end up working harder to make enough money to pay that payment and use whatever's left to survive, which usually isn't much. What I find fault in this argument is you're trying to blame the student for that, which isn't going to solve this problem. And it sounds like you want to persuade people to not risk that and do something else with their life. But you can probably see some problems with telling students to avoid becoming doctors or lawyers or animators or etc. Don't blame the people for wanting to go to college. Blame the system that makes it easier to trap people in. In fact, I don't see you making an overall solution to what you've stated. So, what would you think would be the overall case towards fixing the educational cost, Mr. Enter? Essentially put, the main reason why no one took you seriously at your now-deleted journal entry about your opinions on college is because you made shitty arguments. Either because the points that you made weren't true, or that you used bad reasoning. By the way, I actually found a mirror of Enter's original journal on college because, despite him saying he was using this platform in a YouTube video to talk about this, he actually only talked about it on DeviantArt primarily. And here's a quote that I found to be kind of interesting. Let me just say that I am not critiquing your lifestyle or your choice to go to college. If you chose to go to college, it was most likely the right choice for you. Compare this to John's new position, which I guess can be best summed up as, in the long run, we're all working at Starbucks. And a country going into lockdown when they have an outbreak of a disease, despite not being recommended by health authorities past or present. The invention of quarantining is quite literally the thing that stopped the Black Plague from killing all of Europe. What are you talking about? Also, that's a fucking lie. Let's go ahead and compare this to the Spanish flu back in 1918 and some of the city's lockdowns. Philadelphia did nothing about locking down the city until after the death rate began skyrocketing just eight days afterwards. They've endured the highest peak death rate of all cities studied. Compare that to New York City, where they've locked down just 11 days before the death rate spiked. They had the lowest death rate on the eastern seaboard, just a little under 100 deaths away from St. Louis, where they had a strong social distancing see measures in a low total death rate. Even though they did delay its peaks and deaths, they did face a sharp increase when restrictions were temporarily relaxed. If you had noticed when it comes to the lockdown procedures during the COVID pandemic, you'll see that whenever they try to slowly ease the restrictions, the cases and death rates climb back up. If we do the lockdowns, then not only would it help with making sure that the virus doesn't mutate enough to the point where we're in an endless cycle, but also how doctors wouldn't get overwhelmed and more people would die because they aren't able to care for them, due to the fact that they're being overwhelmed. It's just as scientifically certain as entropy. Our pandemic efforts in 2020 convinced me of only one thing. We are doomed as a species. Doomed to do the song and dance every fucking time. Maybe burning witches is a bad idea. No, if we don't, God will condemn us. Maybe manifest destiny is a bad idea. No, see the shining sea. Maybe interning the Japanese is a bad idea. No, we need to be safe. Maybe the war on drugs is a bad idea. No, we need to be safe. Maybe the war on terror is a bad idea. No, we need to be safe. Maybe lockdowns are a bad idea. No, we need to be safe. I'm sorry, did you just have a big brain moment and compare the lockdowns to the Japanese internment camps, burning the riches, or the war on drugs? 
Oh, I'm sorry, I meant a little brain moment, because these comparisons are just STUPID when they all have nothing to do with locking down the country to keep people safe. At least there's scientific evidence about lockdown procedures and masks, whereas the rest of the things that you've listed are about fear-mongering and all that crap. But Infinity Sign E9EMTR, didn't you know Manifest Destiny was argued through germ theory, which didn't exist yet? I'm sorry, did you just decide to justify the practice of Manifest Destiny here? Yes. Now fuck you. You're getting cancelled. Joke's on you, I'll just turn off the fucking monitor. A lot of people wonder what's going to cause the end of the world. You know, many people claim nuclear war or global warming, or maybe an asteroid. Let me get rid of all of those fears. I know exactly what's going to kill off humanity. Humans will kill the human race. That is an absolute certainty at this point. <laughs> Nuclear war is a human cause! Why did you include it in the first place? And no, I don't mean by nuclear war or conquest. Just the opposite, really. The human race will destroy itself trying to save itself. Because it's more and more apparent that the human desire to save itself is one of the most destructive forces in the entire universe. What do you mean not by nuclear war or conquest when you said that last part? You can have the same effect with the nuclear war fear by claiming that you're trying to save the human race from a tyranny government in a different country, or even if, by your logic, trying to not start another US civil war. Like, what do you freaking mean that's not the same thing? Like, what the fuck? You do know that we stockpiled nuclear weapons during the Cold War specifically to save ourselves, right? It was a theory called mutually assured destruction. So basically what Enter is saying is that we're going to kill ourselves through the nuclear weapons we created specifically to save ourselves because we're dedicated towards saving ourselves. My head hurts. My voice hurts more. What was I talking about again? The Arthur Mask PSA. Oh yeah, aren't we like, going back to the review or something? I would like to get off this bean train here. No, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about how nothing I say on this is going to matter. God damn it! This train has no brakes! Thomas the Tank Engine has no brakes! I'm not usually a determinist, but this is proven to be futile. I could say gloobity globity glorp and it'd be worth that fucking documentary I made that had over 150 sources. Here's where Cameron goes berserk. I mean, even if I shot with their side on this one, they still wouldn't listen to me. I mean, I could say that the science of this PSA is outdated, and apparently now you need to wear two masks. Even if you're vaccinated. Which is great incentive to get vaccinated, by the way, guys. The screenshot you showed just says that wearing two masks has the same effect as wearing one mask that is tighter than normal. Do you even read what you put on screen, John? And it's not worrying at all that a Dutch study that talked down the effectiveness of masks was afraid it couldn't find a publisher, because consensus is the most important thing to science. That's why we know that the sun revolves around the Earth. Science should never be controversial, ever. For the record, I know the study John is talking about, and it didn't find masks were ineffective. At worst, it found that masks were less effective than people generally believed, and were no replacement for social distancing, which is what the CDC had already been saying for months. I, too, have known what Enter is talking about. But only because I found the source that I used from the screenshot. Because here's a fun fact from this article. It's a blog post. A blog post that, A, only gives out the author's, Vinay Prasad's, opinion about the Dutch study, and B, isn't necessarily a thing that proves anything. Hell, Enter showcased the part about whether or not the trial should have been published, but Vinay talks about how people have been making the mask mandate way too political, and has ironically decided to blame the shift on people like you, because, yes, I do personally think that you're making this a political issue. Honestly, I really do not think that this should have been shown in the video via in that screenshot. If you really wanted to talk about that Dutch study, then actually look through the scientific article that the blog post linked. That way you have a much stronger case about your screwed up point about how masks don't work. And I get it. I really do. We all need to have a completely unquestioned priest or preacher who is infallible no matter how many times that Fauci's lied. Masks, asymptomatic spread, herd immunity percentage. When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel a little bit better and it might even block a, a droplet but it's not providing the perfect protection that people think 
that it is. Wait, John, I thought that was your opinion on masks. So you saying it is true, but Fauci saying it is him lying? That doesn't make any sense. I get the point is supposed to be that Fauci later contradicted this, but again, that's not what a lie is. That's called flip-flopping, which yes, is a different thing. That even if there is some asymptomatic transmission, in all the history of respiratory-born viruses of any type, asymptomatic transmission has never been the driver of outbreaks. The driver of outbreaks is always a symptomatic person. Even if there's a rare asymptomatic person that might transmit, an epidemic is not driven by asymptomatic carriers. Those are three major times that Fauci has lied. Actually, Fauci lied only once. The interesting thing about that second clip that he shown off was that it was recorded back in January of 2020, when less information about the coronavirus was discovered. Now, more information has come out, and we're seeing information about how asymptomatic cases are transmitting the virus over to other people. To prove this point, one research article made by Michael A. Jonathan cited that 60% of all new coronavirus cases are from asymptomatic individuals, and that, of the 30% of the asymptomatic individuals, they remain 75% as infectious as those who developed symptoms. The same thing can be said about the first one, where the first clip was made on March the 8th, 2020, on an interview with 60 Minutes, where he made the comment along the lines of, there's no reason to be rocking around with a mask. The CDC actually updated its previous advice and recommends people to wear a mask. Specifically, cloth face coverings and public settings when around people outside their household, especially when social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. The only lie that Fauci made was the screenshot where Fauci said that he can nudge up the herd immunity. Sure, it's a noble lie because Fauci wanted to make sure that less people can get sick, but it's still a lie. So with that being said, I generally don't know why you're saying that the information that we've gotten towards the two clips that you've showed us was considered to be a lie. Because he's not deliberately hiding any information, aka not telling the truth, to the people. It's more so that new information came out and that he was mainly wrong on his previous statements. I mean, even if masks do nothing, they don't have any negative effects. You know, besides the excessive police brutality all across the world, getting people to turn on each other. So two of the issues with masks are that people act like shit. That doesn't make any sense. Also, John trying to link police brutality with masks is, at best, spurious. Seriously, thinking about all the high-profile cases of police brutality throughout 2020, and there were a lot, remember, Basically, none of them had anything to do with masks. George Floyd didn't, Breonna Taylor didn't, Jacob Blake didn't, Rashad Brooks didn't, and although this was a case of a citizen's arrest and not the police, Ahmed Arbery didn't. This is also ignoring the fact that, and I don't know if you know this, John, police brutality occurred before 2020. Rodney King didn't get beaten up by cops in 1991 because Fauci said in 2020 that you should wear a mask. Oh, and Canada recalling masks that contain graphene, which Canada more or less mandated people to wear, because there are health risks associated with graphene. You know, graphene, something that Google, the greatest scientific authority in the world, was pretty confident in until the start of April. Wait, I thought that Google was just a search engine based upon capitalistic values, to the point where they can fetch results to make more money. Was I being lied to then? One of these days you follow the science people should look up thalidomide and see what happens when you use these medical advancements and apparatus without proper testing. Be warned, the pictures can be considered quite disturbing. Children born without limbs often are. Okay, I assume John is talking about the sleeping medication that was briefly made available in Europe in the late 1950s. The one that was much safer than the most popular alternative, which was killing 100,000 people a year, by the way. Now, John is right to say that it led to birth defects among women who used it, and that we did not test for it. The reason we didn't test for it is because we didn't even realize that was possible yet. 
To give you an idea on just how far behind we were regarding how sensitive fetuses are in utero, we didn't even realize smoking while pregnant was a bad idea until the 1970s. John, how much testing do we need to do before we can rule out something that we don't even think can happen? Honestly, this reminds me of a point I entered made in this pandemic video. Hey, Ephraim and Post here, I even have a different avatar now. First one to say who this is in the comments gets their comment pinned, by the way. I normally don't do this, in fact, I criticized somebody for doing something very similar to this not that long ago, but given that this is a co-op, I feel like it's more justified here. Basically, the original idea was I was going to play this clip unedited, and then MTR was going to make a point about it. However, John says some absolutely ridiculous things here that I really feel like I need to point out. And to be honest, I thought it would sound too weird if it was just me commentating on this specific clip in a completely different video with no input from MTR, so I'm doing it in post with the Necklace Wonder here as my avatar. That either completely gave it away or confused you more. I've heard people talk about mandatory vaccines in their panic. Well, with the anti-vaxxer movement, I've heard this one come up a lot in recent years, but it's at the forefront now, and it is a terrible idea. To put it bluntly, mandatory vaccines are a human rights abuse, and every dictator in history would love to have something like that. Honestly, my frustrations with short-sighted people have been bubbling for a very long time now, and this is just the apex of it, but let me put it like this. A government that injected pregnant women with plutonium to see what would happen. John? Isn't that why all research is done? To see what would happen? Unless you're implying these experiments were just done for funsies, in which case you're wrong on that account. These experiments started because at the tail end of the Manhattan Project, scientists wanted to determine the effects of radiation on the human body. And yeah, if you are doing that, you are going to have to test women, considering they are half the population, and include women who are undergoing a natural biological function like pregnancy. Now, none of this is me saying that I agree with everything the federal government did during these experiments, if only because they did not get proper informed consent from many of the people who they injected with plutonium. But this on its own is not inherently unreasonable. The hired a service which unknowingly gave LSD to college students. Okay, we can all see you're using the Wikipedia page for MKUltra. The problem is, it doesn't actually say that. Actually going to Wikipedia's MKUltra page and checking for the section on experiments on LSD finds that the primary targets were prostitutes, drug addicts, prisoners, and mental patients, along with a surprising amount of government employees. Nothing about college students specifically being given LSD is even mentioned. An environment where it was legally allowed and encouraged to forcibly sterilize mentally handicapped people up until the 1970s. Okay, I just have no idea where he got the 1970s for this figure. Buck v. Bell was greatly weakened by Skinner v. Oklahoma, and then eugenics became illegal by proxy through the America's Disabilities Act in 1990. State governments also rarely enforced sterilization laws past the 1950s, so we have a whole series of dates John could have picked from, and he still ended up picking the wrong one. With a medical apparatus that propagated Tuskegee, in a place where lobotomies were the established science. Lobotomies were the established science. John, you know lobotomies are a procedure, not a science, right? Or do you mean they were unquestionable orthodoxy among doctors? Because that's also not entirely entirely true. Sure, they were performed for a long period of time, however, they were always questioned from the beginning because, well, the entire idea was you would make somebody more mentally healthy via cutting out part of their brain. And that just didn't make sense to a lot of people. And it turned out those people were right. <laughs> which had such a great eugenics program that Hitler wrote a love letter to it. No, Hitler wrote a fan letter to one specific American eugenicist, that being Madison Grant, the author of the 1924 book The Passing of the Great Race. In fact, the article specifically makes mention that American eugenicists were commonly envious of what Hitler was able to do, with the article directly saying, 
Leon Whitney, executive secretary of the American Eugenic Society, declared of Nazism, quote, while we were pussyfooting around, the Germans were calling a spade a spade. Does not get the right to mandate something like forced injections. Ever. No matter how annoying Karen is on Facebook. Anyway, that's all I had to say. Back to you, MTR, and Ephraim in the past, I guess. Now, I want to state before arguing here that no... I'm not going to be talking about whether or not we should have vaccine mandates. In fact, both of us are going to agree with Enter here that we shouldn't have vaccine mandates because of legitimate exceptions for someone who cannot take a vaccine, such as immunocompromised people. Or in my case, because I do agree with John that they are needlessly authoritarian and blatantly, in the case of the United States, unconstitutional. However, what I am arguing about here is that Enter is comparing these past clinical studies, such as the Tuskegee Civil experiment to a vaccine that has multiple testing phases before it goes to the public. You know, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment involves injecting black men with syphilis and just observing them over the course of the study, which is something where we're not preventing someone from getting sick, but just observing someone getting sick. I essentially do not get your over arguments here, because you're essentially saying that the public will suffer if we're taking a vaccine that's been proven to be safe, versus a couple of studies that aren't comparable to the vaccine. Honestly, I'm starting to suspect that your favorite fallacy other than the false dichotomy fallacy would be the false equivalence fallacy, because you're pretty much comparing apples to oranges here. Even then, what John was saying was totally irrelevant to the conversation. Mandatory vaccines aren't bad because because Tuskegee happened. Hell, in the clip he specifically says the United States government shouldn't do such a thing because of that, the plutonium files, and eugenics. Which also implies that had those things not happened, John would be fine with vaccine mandates. So John's issue, in his words, is that other bad things have happened. Not even that vaccine mandates allow for other bad things to happen, just that other bad things have happened in the past. Going back to a point I made a little bit ago, why can John have all the strong opinions he wants no matter the circumstances, but nobody else can? Anyways, the main reason why I've decided to bring that clip up was because it felt like as if this was the same issue that you're making. Within this section here, you're comparing a mask mandate in Canada, something in which case I will concede about by saying that Canada should have been better towards making sure that the masks weren't poisonous, to something in which case that was mainly used more as an overall prescription, rather than something in which case that was an overall mandate. Again, I generally don't know as towards what your overall process is. Because you've decided to use the sleeping medication to help your overall argument about the mask that the children had to use in Canada. According to this PSA, because Muffy is wearing a mask, it is absolutely okay for her father to have this big blowout sales event for cars, which will most likely encourage a mass gathering. The most essential thing to buy in a pandemic. This goes on without any sort of shaming or criticism whatsoever. Really responsible to encourage mass gatherings, Arthur. I really love the assumptions that you're making here. Look, what I will concede on is making a big blowout sales event for motorized vehicles is kinda stupid in hindsight when it comes down to the pandemic, but we don't know if there's going to be a lot of people in this place, nor are we going to assume that they're not practicing social distancing protocols. I mean, this is never mind that, considering that you probably want me to link at least one thing that's considered right-leaning, I guess. The Wall Street Journal reported that car sales were down almost 20% during the pandemic, with car and driver saying that by the end of the year, sales were down from 14.9 to 15.5% overall. Yeah, they've tried to rebound back near the end of the year, but at the beginning of the pandemic in the US, we saw places to be mostly barren. We don't know where they're in time wise because of the fact that they're in the pandemic right now just like us out in the real world, so we don't know if things are going back to normal, or if they're slightly easing restrictions during that time period. And no, I'm not counting the upload date of the PSA in question. So it's more than likely that not a lot of people showed up at the sales event because they want to keep abiding social distancing protocols. Honestly, I'm just confused by John's point here. So, it's absolutely insane to buy a car during a pandemic, and that's why he thinks everyone is going to be at a car sale during a pandemic. Nothing about this makes any sense. 
That being said, keep the part that Muffy's father had a job outside of his house during the pandemic in mind, as this will be important for a future discussion. You got any other pieces of advice? If we all do our part, we can get rid of this virus. You disgust me, viscerally. Let me be the bearer of bad news, Arthur. COVID is endemic. We're not getting rid of this virus entirely. The best we can do is defend against it. In all of human history, we've only eradicated one virus. That was smallpox. Nowadays, it only exists in a lab. And that's after we got a vaccine and 200 years for a virus that's less infectious than COVID. Seriously, if you fuck around in the Arizona desert, you could still get the Black Plague. You know, the one that killed like a third of the world's population. Okay, John, you do know we can't create a vaccine for the Black Plague, right? With that said, if you catch it today, there are actually ways of treating it. You might have heard of them. Uh, they're called antibiotics. And by the way, effective treatment is what people typically mean when they say, get rid of this virus. I'm just wasting my breath and making my throat sore for no reason. It's a moot point anyway. Everything I just said means nothing to no one. Just like virtually every fucking wear a mask statement that's ever been said. All of it amounts to a grand total of SHIT! We've learned this with abstinence-only education. Just telling people to do something like this has a backfire effect if it does anything at all. Ah uh, yes, mask mandates and abstinence-only education. The two genders. But seriously, the reason why abstinence-only education doesn't work is because humans are biologically programmed to want to have sex. Are humans biologically programmed to not want to wear a mask? Because if so, you need to present evidence of that claim, which you haven't. What's the story, Ben, since Fauci flip-flopped? That's right, wearing one mask is all it takes to basically save lives. One mask is a perfect magic bullet. Here, here, here's the funny thing. If wearing two masks is really important, that means that every single time you've only been wearing one mask, you've been spreading the virus! But I guess that's not a problem, unless you've assumed that the mask is 100% effective at any point in time. Even though the CDC did not make a recommendation to wear two masks towards any normal circumstances, they only did recommend people to wear two masks if you have a beard, and neither of which is a mask filter or brace, nor have you shaved the beard close to your face. However, the interesting thing about what Enter said was that Dr. Fauci didn't advise it. On January the 25th, 2021, he appeared on the Today Show via in an interview where he said this, If you have a physical covering with one layer, you put another layer on. It just makes common sense that likely would be more effective, and that's the reason why you see people either double masking or doing a version of an N95. He did not advise people to double up, but he thought that it was common sense for people to do. Afterwards, he appeared to answer some questions from members of the AFT, or the American Federation of Teachers, and the NEA, or the National Education Association, where he said, and I quote, the CDC has not changed any of its recommendations about mask wearing in the sense of saying wear two mask or do an N95. They haven't gone there. They have just said everybody should wear a mask. To even further prove this, Ellie Klen on Twitter posted a video where Fauci said this directly after what I've said in the quote. There are many people who feel, you know, if you really want to have an extra little uh, bit of protection, maybe I should put two masks on. There's nothing wrong with that, but there's no data that indicates that that is going to make a difference. And that's the reason why the CDC has not changed the recommendation. If anything, he never flip-flopped, or at least I don't recall him flip-flopping in that sense. You can still wear one mask, but if you want to be safe, you can double up. However, there was no data about doubling up to begin with, so there was no recommendation on the CDC website. He only thought that it was common sense and didn't advise anyone against it, but he also didn't recommend it. Meanwhile, because I am skeptical of masks, I have basically just stayed home and ordered things online and stayed away from other people. It's been hell on my psyche and the walls in my house move every single day, but this is how you properly social distance. Look, I'm honestly sorry if for whatever reason that I'm using a term that might be considered to be an 
SJW terminology, but Enter over here is actually pretty privileged enough to at least have a job inside his household. Meanwhile, other Americans simply couldn't afford to stay inside during the pandemic and had to work remotely. Even if Enter acknowledged somewhere on the internet that he was complaining about people who can't afford to stay home, he also ignored that opening up the country during the pandemic would actually harm people in poverty, which would make them and their loved ones get the disease. I mean, there's also that he dismissed the idea about the government giving people money during the pandemic in order for them to stay alive, as well as saying that healthcare shouldn't be a human right during one of his other videos on his other channel. That's more than likely taken down, but people such as YouTube Dude have went ahead and covered that. So, let's head back to Muffy Stad back in 5 interjections go. Ignoring that him working at a car dealership is considered to be an essential workplace. In fact, let's play the twist of game of pretend that being a car dealer is not essential. And while I still agree with you that the writers of the PSA shouldn't use the phrase big sales event, though I'm still a little bit annoyed at the assumptions you've made, I could see where Muffy Sad is going. This is because Muffy Sad can't afford to stay at home, and with car sales dropping at the start of the pandemic, he needs to persuade people to buy more cars so that he can earn more money in order to keep his house. Without that, then his family would be on the streets. This in turn could create issues such as spreading the virus faster. If the government would have provided more money for people during the pandemic, then they can stay at home longer without having to be in fear of eviction notices or getting essential items like food or water. Too long then listen, it's good that you're staying outside at home during the pandemic, but you're ignoring those who simply can't stay indoors. Whether masks work or they don't, my conscience is clear. How about you? Because if this does turn out to be security theater, it can have a major backfire effect. So you better hope, uh, for your sake, for all of our sakes, that one mask is effective enough. Instead of, you know, all of our protocols and all of our advancements being so useless you still need to do all of this shit even after taking a vaccination. If the protocols are useless, why would we keep doing them? Anyway, did you guys know that this was going to be originally in the same video as part 2? I kinda had to cancel that for what should be obvious reasons. Join us next time where John talks about race, and let me just warn you, that is the worst part of the video. Good night, and good luck.